So, uh, yeah. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> good morning. With, how are, good how are morning. you? Yeah. No, it's um, I, I really appreciate uh, getting a chance to uh, to meet you, Jeff, and uh, and to talk to you about this stuff. I've been uh, uh, I've been trying to get uh, just kind of foot yeah, a foothold in the space. Um, um, and but uh, why don't you uh, kind of introduce yourself? Uh, tell tell my audience who you are, and then kind of yeah, how we how we ended up getting connected here. Yeah, awesome. My my name is Jeff Reed. I um, so I I run a, several organizations. One, the Church Digital. Uh, which helps uh, establish physical churches better understand how to do digital ministry. Uh, I uh, co-founded a nonprofit digital church network, which is aimed at uh, planting uh, digital churches, metaverse churches, um, some digital churches, micro Zoom kind of models as yep. well. Gaming churches is becoming a more popular um, mm -hmm model to start to explore even in 22 heading into 23 and so it's really more uh, a lot of what i do is centered around bleeding edge uh tip of the spear innovation type we're on that two percent of the innovation curve yeah um helping a lot of that through, through digital church network and then i work for a number of organizations um here in in america uh leadership network new thing network uh leadership network touting metaverse stuff Mm -hmm. New Thing Network, uh, Digital Discipleship is really the piece there. Uh, starting to work globally with an organization called uh, Media Impact International, uh, working in uh, the 1040 window, um, you know, uh, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, places where it's very hard to get the church into. We're yeah. using digital methods to, to get it there. And then there's partners out the wazoo that, that are – very excited about uh, the church and digital space. What's interesting to me, and this is, you got to realize, just backstory on me, the first Bible study I ever taught online was in the year 2000. Like, I have been doing this for 20-plus mm -hmm. years. And for 20-plus years, or 20 years, at least up until, you know, March 2020, there was a line of people telling me, hey, Jeff, you're wrong. Hey, Jeff, it doesn't work that way. I had pastors mm -hmm. telling me I should confess my sins before God. For oh, taking wow. the people out of the bride of Christ, his physical church. Mm -hmm. and, and so COVID validated mm -hmm. a lot. And, and 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 maybe, you know, we can get into this maybe. Maybe the U.S. church is a little, still a little hesitant. They want to go back to the building. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating is, is there's enough people that are wanting to lean into it. There's enough organizations. There's enough churches that are wanting to experiment, that are wanting to do something different. They're recognizing they, they can reach a different type of person digitally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's worth it at this point because yeah. there's there's a crowd of, you know, we say out here at the, with the Church Digital, let's go with the goers. And, and for us right now, there's, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of churches that do want to go. Yeah. Uh, are there laggards? Of course. Uh, but there are, are there's enough to make the trip worthwhile today. Yeah. Uh, so one of the reasons why I, I kind of started doing videos on this topic is uh, is I actually wrote a book uh, about kind of online ministry prior to the pandemic. Um, it uh, it did kind of reasonably well and stuff. But um, but like you said, like uh, the uh, COVID validated a lot of that, like a lot of the kind of theory that early adopters had. And that was one of my uh, my issues is that uh, the book I wrote, I saw a lot of things just come like, yeah, I totally saw that was going to happen if we ever went online. And lo and behold, it did. And then uh, there was a bunch of stuff that I, I didn't anticipate and I got wrong. And what kind of came out of that? And one of the first questions I want to ask you is this kind of thing place distinctive that we, I don't think the church has ever like officially or like in a meaningful way uh, wrestled with in, in a way kind of that uh that would be cross denominational or anything like that where like what are we going to treat the internet as is it a thing because it's a piece of technology is it a place because it kind of facilitates community in a way that's not just you know epistolary like where you're sending letters or sending texts or or that kind of stuff so um so that's that's my first question is for for you i mean i'm not sure if you've ever had to like think like about it in that terms because it seems like you've just you're on one side of it, but um, yeah. So, what what is the internet to you? Is it a thing yeah, or a that's, place? That's it. That's interesting. First off, I don't think we, the church, I don't think we get to decide whether it's a thing or a place. I, you know, I, I think we've given up the seat of defining what it is. Now, culturally, uh, that's it's maybe a little bit of both. Uh, mm. I mean, there's definitely methods 
where you can use we use language like communications and community where yeah. you know and physical churches understand this hey you know what we're gonna put our event our, our front door event we're gonna do a worship night we want to invite the community to it it's gonna be on friday night somebody create a facebook event so yeah. let's post about it on social media let's create a hashtag but the the community aspect for the average physical church is within that building mm-hmm. sunday morning 9 and ten forty five in the morning and so the the drive is to use the thing of the internet i guess in your terms to drive people to the the physical location where the community is mm-hmm. now we're getting closer to this place but as we get more you know millennials more gen z more people that are are, are more comfortable with this technology that we're moving beyond it being a thing. We're mm-hmm. actually blurring the lines between, I mean, virtual reality is great at this. It's blurring the lines between even virtual reality is a physical reality. It is a real reality. It may not be tangible or touchable, but the things that happen in that space are real. And as a result of this technology that's starting to roll out, no, we're very much looking at digital as community. Now, People my age, I'm sorry, I'll out myself, I'm 45. People my age borderline get it. The 75-year-olds, my, my father yeah. doesn't get it. My father has no no grounding whatsoever of what, what I'm doing. Now my son, mm-hmm. who's 12, he has no understanding of that dividing line because for him, it's yeah. all blurred into one mush. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, to, to even... Even separate it where we're, where we're going, I, I think is wrong. But because we are laggards, because we're trying to define where we're going with clarity and communication, we have I I intentionally separate it not because I think it needs to get separated, but because it needs to be communicated mm-hmm. clearly. When uh, when you say stuff though, like uh, like that, the virtual reality space is real um, because you get these um, like the language moves so fast on this. Like, what what do you mean by real, and and is that the same real as uh, like in person church is real? Like, and th- that's maybe where I come from. Where with the yeah. the thing place distinctive is when we when we look to scriptures as it talks about church, it's only talking about places in a way that's defined as like an, a, a non-virtual place because obviously there wasn't technology, but I think also because that's the, the intent behind it. So when we get to this option to have a virtual space, because it's not defined for us through scriptures, like who, how are we deciding that it's real? Like, or, or maybe how does your, your church or your organization, how, how did it come to that? Uh, that's yeah. one of the things I've, I've really struggled to find and uh but I think I think it's out there somewhere where like this is this is the steps we went through to like get us to this point and you know and how we how we base these assertions that the online space is a, is a space. Yeah. I you know ironically I literally wrote a book on this that that's getting published um in November. And oh, cool. so uh it's uh if you go to the church.digital/vrbook mm-hmm. it'll redirect you to uh, the book you can download it you can One. buy it from amazon it'd be great so the church.digital yeah. vr book but let me answer your question commercial over Let's no no that, that's it. good the thing is yeah. no one wrote about this stuff so yeah. like we're in this age where i think a lot of guys like yourself are going to and i'm really excited for it i like books as you can tell so <laughs> the uh this this is what i would say like the Church in virtual reality is by far the most controversial thing I've ever said in my life. You know, if you go to my YouTube, you can see 10x more hate on that topic than anything else I've, I've ever said. And I've, I've been a loudmouth majority of my life. Um, but, you know, it was funny. I was actually on, I was on a radio station. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a Christian radio station that wanted to interview me because of the virtual reality stuff. And I didn't get much of a setup. For, for the guy I didn't know, really know his angle what he was looking for just kind of jumped on the thing and you know I'm, I'm that guy just jumping you know both feet mm-hmm. and uh, and so I come on and the first thing this guy says to me on the radio station so Jeff you don't actually believe that people can get saved in virtual oh, reality man. do you <laughs> and, uh, and 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 I looked at I looked at him he's saying he's like that doesn't count that doesn't count towards the kingdom it has to have be done physically mm-hmm. and I was like well let me ask you a sec- let me ask you another question um what if I had sex in virtual reality? Well, that's it. That's Would that count? 
Well, and that's interesting because I, I go to the same kind of places when I, uh, with where I'm worried about where this, this defining of places goes because um, that, that argument, like what if I have sex in virtual reality, does that count? That's like, well, if we make it count in one place, it's, it, the door swings both ways. It almost, it doesn't count in the other place because you get to decide how reality works there. And, and that's yeah. one of the dangers I think happens is uh, when you can use what is ostensibly an object or a collection of objects like the internet uh, for righteousness sake, you can use it justifiably to keep yourself righteous in, while practicing sin and just follow the same logical framework. I'm like, well, we did it for church and it wasn't sin. How come we can't do it for sex and it's not sin? You know, it's like that, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, and again, this is the leading edge of all this kind of talk. No one wrote books about this stuff. No one was picturing that we'd ever have to like tangle with, um, with these issues as a church in seminaries 40 years ago. No one was that far sighted to say, ah, oh, we're going to have to figure out how we do church in virtual reality eventually you know like it's it's gonna happen because you know technology progresses so like let's start talking about that now instead you know we stick to the classic church fights of you know oh, are we are we dunking people or sprinkling people you know it's like what happens when it's digital no one's talking about that oh well I listen you you can i've had plenty of those fights um the, I mean, I can watch. The is, it, is it good popcorn? baptizing just... baptizing people in virtual reality baptizing people digitally but like um, you, uh, like normal people baptizing in, in a pool at home, like there's, uh, it has to be done by a certain person in a certain way in a certain process, and you know there you can, you can read the Bible with Lee. I mean, you you certainly can. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible never says anything about virtual reality. Therefore, everything has to be tangible and physical. Now, yeah. to your point, I actually can we be consistent. Like mm. we worship a God that we cannot see. We were we were brought by grace by a savior who lived 2000 years ago. And there is a nebulous Holy Spirit that that invades and guides us in what we're doing. What is tangible and physical about any of that? Mm -hmm. Like there is no there is no attribute towards the physicality. Yes. The communities were, were physical, but Paul, I, irony, ironically, was distributing his message, bringing people to Christ globally through the Roman road and letters. Mm -hmm. and, and so, like, to say that that we should not use this technology, that we should not be the church in, in these communities, I just find it hard to believe. Because when I look biblically, I see Paul, the great church planner, doing what he was doing to start new communities wherever it was to get the word out as they went they preached the gospel and, think and i think it's good oh no, no no go ahead no sorry i, I didn't mean to interrupt but no just, please uh do you think there's a distinction then because like, i think you nailed it with what you said there that you know um like why aren't we being the church in these online spaces and stuff but do you think that there's a a distinction between being the church as as christians living authentic christian lives of witness and and you know, discipleship practices, all that kind of stuff, how that translates into these spaces versus actual worship as like a church, like does, you know, that, and that's, that's one of the things is it's, it's our language doesn't lend itself to, um, to these spaces the way um, I think it can kind of get confused in these spaces. Like, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on for probably 95 to 99% of all, all the ways we can be the church online, but the like doing church, like actual like Sunday worship services and what that has represented historically uh, and its importance kind of to the, to the, to the global church, the, the local church sure. expression. I think that that's where that's going to be one of the problems is that f making that line fuzzy uh, I think is where the most problems are going to get caused and the most kind of strife happens because it is hard to tell the difference between like what's a local expression, what's, you know, a universal expression of the church. Yeah. Whereas like a local expression baptizes believers into, into the church, but also it's a way of like connecting them as, as like a local expression where, you know, yeah, I know that guy's baptized. I'm going to, you know, take that confession of faith seriously in our interactions together. You know, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, what what I would respond to that would be if you actually looked at the Acts two, the Bible, the mm. the biblical ecclesiology centered around this. I think a lot of what you see on, on the average street corner in your church buildings, at least in America, I think it's extra biblical. I I, I don't mm. I don't see the forty minute sermon. I don't see the 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 worship set with the amps. I don't see the haze machine. I don't see the lights. I don't see the LED wall. By the way, a, a open confession here. That was my job at the established church. I have mm. created tens of thousands of worship services in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, Multi-site, multi, -site, multi mo different denominations were running through it. Like that was that was the role. And yeah. actually, what what brought me to the church digital was actually looking back, even introspective in my own life, 15, 20 years of creating these church services and asking myself, do I actually know of a disciple who was created as a result of mm. what I had done? And an open confession hour here, I couldn't come up with many, not 15 to 20 years worth of effort. And so I don't know, like when I look at what the church is today, I don't see it modeling what, what the, at least in the U S model, I don't see it modeling what, what I see in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think we've got an opportunity to do something different with this technology, with the digital community, not trying to copy what's happening in the U S church buildings but instead trying to do something different. By the way, the digital churches that are doing something different, that are reimagining that ecclesiology, mm -hmm. what we're actually finding is they are successfully reaching a different type of person right. than the buildings are reaching. I can tell you stories of uh, church services that are operating in, uh, in virtual reality, 75% uh, percent de churched people reconnecting to the bride of Christ mm -hmm. through virtual reality. 80 to 85 percent uh, atheist agnostics uh, coming to church to ask questions, to engage with uh, the, the word of God for the first time in a safe environment. I can yeah. tell you stories of Satanists and neo-pagans who have had their life changed through digital and, and metaverse relationships. Like there's this is not the type what the work that they're doing digitally is not challenging the building. It's doing something different. And, okay. and by the way, I see a lot of of micro church connected in this as well we've yeah. got a lot of digital churches that are connecting to a micro church at the same time they're they're in other words they're distributing their message digitally uh and then people are doing watch parties they're doing micro locations in homes mm -hmm. um and, and so the the misnomer is that that digital church has no physical physicality is is wrong we want there to be physicality, online to offline. The gospel that we hear in our online world, it has to influence our offline relationships. Otherwise, we're just creating consumers. And yeah. so it's not, hey, let's consume a product and a podcast isolated from the world. No, it's how do we get you connected into your community? How do we equip you to be the light of Christ in the physical world where we are? It's much more of a distribution method. Uh, mm -hmm. We're utilizing the network not as a, a virtual gathering place, but a distribution network to get the gospel out in front of people. Okay. So how does that work when you're when you're planting digital-only churches? This is something that I've uh, seen on your website where, where you talk about it, um, where, like, how, how does that work for, like, staffing? How does that work for um, accountability? Like, it, it, it seems like um, while these problems aren't uh, like universally solved simply by having an in-person uh, like expression in a building and stuff like that, um, there's there's a whole history and system set up to get to get you a qualified pastor in that sense. Are, are we just taking those people instead of finding them a church where they can have an office, you know, to put their library and then and then write their sermons? We're just taking them and putting them onto an online, like getting them connected with an online space. Like how, how does that work? That's a great question. Um, we're, we're discovering a new model of pastor coming out of this. Um, by the way, I've, I've had conversations with maybe five, 600 people at this point that are interested in planting uh, a digital church, a metaverse church, a church mm -hmm. more on the digital than on the physical side. Um, and, and, and almost to the T, the story goes like this. Jeff, I found you on Google. No one else is talking about this. Um, my pastor does not understand what I'm talking about. My church is not willing to support me. My denomination has no understanding whatsoever. It doesn't care about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Even my even my spouse and my friends 
don't understand what I'm talking about because they've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we created Digital Church Network to be the the sending denomination, the the organization. We're not a denomination, but the sending organization. We, we, we created it to be the, the training center where we can provide care, community, uh, and, and coaching to help start these churches. By the way, um, almost to the T, 75, 80% of these people that we're talking to about planning these churches are bivocational. They've got a nine to five job uh, outside of the church. Mm. And, and by the way, the, the budget on these churches are, are ridiculous, like small. Uh, I think the largest digital church in the U.S., right now is reaching about 16 to 17,000 people. It's in a, uh, it's in a Facebook group. Uh, it, the co-pastors, husband and wife are both bivocational. He works in security. She's a, like a, a speaker who travels and, and, and speaks in the church circuit. Mm -hmm. But what their operating budget is for the church to reach 16 to 17,000 people a week, a thousand regular online small groups, 51% of their audience is outside of the U.S., and they're even growing into micro locations. That budget is $40,000 a year. And they just kind of offset what would be, like, so I work at a big church, and we, we've, we you know, millions of dollars kind of go through these these big churches like this. And so in, in that situation, they're really just offsetting the main teaching and kind of discipleship top-down onto the online platform. And and then encouraging, I guess, the community engagement, which we would have a department for in a budget line, that's all done expressly by the people then, as opposed to through a church by the people. So there's no, there's no like tithing in and then back out. Um, they do, the average digital church is going to do tithing. Um, I, ironically, the IRS actually does not accept a, uh, a digital church or a metaverse church as an existence of a church because you have to have a physical address with a building, according to the IRS. And, but they, these digital churches do register in the U.S. 501c3 as a, uh, as a nonprofit or as a... Oh, uh, that's, that's actually community. very interesting. That So, like, the you can't be a church, um, you can't be a religious church and have that exemption in the States unless you have a physical space. Yes. And, that and is... Which is but it, it can't be a studio. We're it's interesting. We're actually that in the middle of trying to figure out how to how to how to overcome this because the, the IRS is, is Do they is have like a government a mandated amount of pews? Because I want to see that. That would be hilarious. That, that actually would be funny uh to, to do that. So that there's a there's a challenge towards it. But we do see giving, uh, but realize, you know, a lot once again, a lot of these churches they're reaching non Christians. Uh and, and so some of these pastors aren't even comfortable like using the word tithe or or money because because yep. they're being very missional a lot of these churches yep. are paying it out of their own back pockets yep. uh to to allow the ministry to happen or going to select people uh, about giving and supporting uh the the ministry up front sure so yeah that's that's really what that looks like so for pastoral training what does your organizational or organization do to kind of facilitate that like <clears throat> Like, um, I, I'm thinking of the, and I, and I hate to compare it like that because we are talking about something new, but like, there's going to be comparisons where like, um, you know, certain churches have seminaries that they draw their staff from, you know, because they know that like the, these, these organizations teach what we want. And then we're going to get our pastors from those seminaries, you know, unless it's in a, uh, an exceptional individual that we're able to kind of pull into a church you know, in, in that regard. So like, how does that work for, for training wise? Like what are the qualifications? Is it, is it the same as what you would expect from a pastor? Uh, but uh, just di a different method of getting their gifts into use. Yeah. I, to be honest, we, we actually see a lot more organic uh, realize that the, the, the methods that we use for digital church, what we talk about um, it, it's interesting. We have conversations on, on the side, uh, with with friends, is it better to have a million person church or a hundred thousand churches of ten? Mm. And in and in the digital side, in the digital space, we're much more interested in a hundred thousand churches of ten than a million person church. Mm -hmm. The the methods that that we talk about and that we promote are involve decentralization, uh, involve em empowering lay people 
um, you know, working into scale, uh, multiplication, not growth. And, and so the idea of uh, to to lead a million person church, um, it that takes an incredibly strong leader, and and it takes um, you know, organizational structures and systems, and but you know what, that dude ain't agile. There's no mm -hmm. way a million person church is going to be agile. What we push more towards is a hundred thousand churches of ten. Mm -hmm. Hey, how do you lead a, a a ten, a twenty, a fifty person church? What what's what's involved in that? Yeah, uh, and so for for us, we're more of a, a I'm, and you can use some international terms, a disciple making movement, a DMM that grows into a church planting movement, CPM. Okay, so we want to take people through a process where we train them on how to be a disciple, grow them on how to be a leader. That is planting churches. That's mm. multiplying churches in the networks. And that's eventually multiplying networks in, in the movements. And so for us, it's a long-term process of growing someone and maturing someone spiritually to where they're telling others about Jesus, who are telling others about Jesus, who are telling others about Jesus, even to the point of creating uh, fresh expressions, new expressions, different expressions, of church. Okay. Mike, have you ever heard of Seth Godin? Do you know who Seth Godin is? Oh, yeah. I know Seth. Okay. Yeah. So somebody asked Seth Godin, December 2019, somebody asked Seth Godin on his podcast, hey, Seth, how do I get my message heard around the world? Ironically, the guy who asked the question was in Turkey. It was on Seth's podcast. Ah. And um, How do I do this? Like, yeah, you're yeah, doing it. <laughs> you're doing it right now. Um, but, but Seth, I want to thank you for that. I have told that joke 50 times, and you're like the first guy to really catch it. Thank you. Uh, but listen, here, here, not, here's what how do people not know I don't, about I don't Seth? Know. I, don't, I don't know. He's but written like here's, half a dozen books. Like he's all yeah, over oh, church no, stuff. No, no, he's 20 books. Uh, but dude's Jewish, which was really what makes this this interesting. Seth Godin replied, a billion people don't care about anything you have to say. <laughs> There's no way to get a billion people to, to buy in. You got to think smaller. 100,000, 100 million, 10 million, 1 million, 100,000, 10,000. If you really want to get your message heard around the world, you got to craft a message specifically for an individual, get them to hear it, get them to understand it, get them to tell someone else. And so as a result, Seth Godin, one of the top marketing brains in the, in the continent, if not the planet, yeah. is, is basically describing, hey, you want to get your message heard? It's basically how Jesus did the church, discipleship, tell somebody a message, get them to understand it, tell them to tell somebody else. And yeah. so when we see these digital churches, I mean, I told you about my friend who's the 17,000 person church and mm. good for him. The average digital church, 100 to 200 people, uh, 75, 50. Uh, it's far more relational. It's far more engaging and interactive. Mm. Um, and it's scalable. Yeah. Like you, you get somebody who's called to be on mission. Who's your persona? Who's your target audience? Who do you want to go reach? Go reach them. Yeah, let's help you do that. And so we're seeing even multiplication uh, from Twitch streamers to virtual reality churches to the Facebook churches where we're multiplying and, and starting to empower even people within us to create new expressions of church. So what's the um, and maybe there isn't one um, in, in, in your regard. So I don't mean to kind of lead you with the question, but um, one sec here. Um, what's the, um, just lost my train of thought there. What, what's the end point then? Or what, what's too far then? Uh, is there anything that online church can do? Like we've, we've talked a lot about what online church can do, but, um, but, uh, perhaps, yeah, yeah. What, what it can do and be successful at, what can't the online church do where it's like this, this is something that we're either asking too much of the technology or, or yeah, or, or this is trespassing a line where like, no, we're, we're doing something unbiblical, but it's, you know, or unchristian, but it's, it's allowable on an online space. Yeah. So I've, I've sat down with biblical scholars um, and, and, and I've asked them that. Um, I, I've sat down with people that I, that actually are not pro technology, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and ask those, those questions for their perspectives. And, and you know what, I, what I've heard the majority of the time, uh, Jeff, it's going to take, it's going to take a couple of decades to figure out the ecclesiology of virtual reality, the ecclesiology of digital. 
Mm. Um, and, and, and the reason why is let's take virtual reality, for example, virtual reality right now. Yeah, it's been around five, six, seven years. It's in its infancy still like yeah. this technology is is not developed. The stuff that I mean, yeah, virtual reality. I had somebody tell me, you know, you put on the goggles, you're looking at some like cartoony character. I can't actually see their facial reactions. I don't know what what they're doing like jeff this isn't this is substandard compared to having conversations physically and and they're not wrong but where we're going you know in, instead of staring at you in a, in a web camera looking at your background with the books um on, on a zoom on a computer monitor uh you're going to be a hologram and, and i'm going to be sitting at a starbucks and, and you're going to be projected in the chair across from me and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not looking at computer avatar 8-bit version of mike i'm looking at mike being projected hologram sitting at the table in front of me mm -hmm. and so the the ability to utilize that technology for authentic conversations to engage with people in new ways to to, to share jesus to maybe break down the walls of even physical locality um, yeah. look the, some of the challenges of, of where we're going are going to radically redefine what we consider real yeah. Like I, I, I can go to a museum in South Beach and I can see the Mona Lisa, the hologram of the Mona Lisa, a 12K version yeah. of Mona Lisa on the wall. Did I actually see the Mona Lisa? Well, actually, and that's, that's a great question. And that's something that I've always struggled with. And like, I think like to your point where the ecclesiology is going to take a decades to kind of figure out on this stuff. Um that's something I've always struggled with because how the the scriptures deal with like places and things are concrete. They're they're in a way that can't be anything but themselves. Like the church at Ephesus was in Ephesus. It wasn't a representation of Ephesus. And and that's why I, I always bring it back to is this a thing or a place? Because if it's a place, I think we're like on track, 100%, like we we are good to go. And I think we're doing things exactly how Christians could do. But if it's a thing and we're treating it like a place and there's nothing really to stop us from doing so, we get in this fuzzy area of like calling things, misrepresenting things at, at worst, I think, or maybe at best. And then like all these kind of fuzzy problems where it's like we're not actually you know, we're not actually in a place we're using a thing. We're we're not actually seeing the Mona Lisa. We're seeing a facsimile, and the, there's this question of like where where does reality start? And and I think it it starts where the user is, and and their intentions onto it are everything that's the the falsehood there, or where it could be. And that, that's that's where I put because I I agree with you. Like yeah, the. Uh, the 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 technology allows for a different kind of experience whenever you're doing that. Yeah, the easiest way to see this, especially if you're afraid of heights. Uh, I'm not afraid of heights, but I've I noticed I get a, a reaction where if you're watching a guy hanging off a crane and you're in like you know 4K, you feel it in your toes. You feel that sensation of being too high, and then you dial it down to 360 and you don't. And it's like, yeah, that's that what what happened there is something that we need to talk about as a church, because at one point it feels real. And then you can without changing the content coming towards you, but just changing how it's perceived, you can make it unreal and, at a visceral level simply by dialing it back down to a lower level. Hmm. So and that yeah. that's why I worry so much about this is because yeah it's church and you feel you feel the same emotions and the same connection and all that kind of stuff when you're hearing music online as you do in person all that kind of stuff until you add some buffering and then it's like yeah this is this real because you can't buffer real life you know you 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 don't have lag you don't have pixelization all all that kind of stuff and is that something tech and this is the big question i think for the online ecclesiology to answer is like does technology allow for this even even though we are doing it where it gets to a point where like actually no if the technology is great enough it does allow for it because now we're seeing these same reactions that you could see in a real life you know yeah certain setting and circumstance you know, I, I guess I guess my response to that would be, you know, I, I think we, the U.S. Church, we've tried to pack the Holy Spirit into a box in a in a framework, and I don't know that dude uh, goes into the framework as much as we really want him to. No, um, and, and I struggle 
listen, I had a um this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a weird story. Uh all right, we're back. <laughs> uh, you're gonna um, tell me a story here about yeah. Yeah, so so I'm I'm gonna apologize for, for maybe the graphicness of, of the story, but I, I, I oh. met a girl. I, I I met a girl I was speaking at a conference up in Chicago and um it was funny. I said the word VR chat. I talk about this in the book, but I said the word VR chat. It's one of the worlds of virtual reality. Mm-hmm. And 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 she she about fell out of her chair as soon as I said the word. I thought she fell asleep on me, which is common. And uh, but I, I I just I kept I was talking about VR chat a lot in this section. And and five or six times I said the word VR chat in about three minutes. And every time I said VR chat, she had a noticeable drastic reaction to me saying the word VR chat. And, and so this was getting weird. It was getting awkward in the room. Every murmuring starting to happen. I send everybody on a break. Uh, I ask uh, one of the ladies in the room to stick around because I wanted to talk to this girl. And by the way, this girl wasn't getting out of her chair. She was staying right where, right where she was. Yep. And, and she, she proceeded to start to tell me stories uh, about how she was raped in virtual reality mm. um, in, in this world called VR chat. Mm-hmm. Now, I listen, I, I, I mean, in that moment, I'm, I'm hearing the story. Uh, she was she was not as before Christ for her, but this was maybe two or three years earlier. Mm. And so this girl, three years later, is still carrying damage uh, as a result of virtual reality in these world in these communities. And and side note, she looks at me and she says, Jeff, because of what happened to me in, in VR chat in virtual reality, the church has no business being a virtual reality. Yeah. I, I looked at her and I was like, I'm sorry, because of what happened to you is exactly why the church needs to be in virtual reality. Like this is the calling for us to, to get into that space. Mm-hmm. Now I tell that story in this context because, because of this, was she actually raped? Like did, mm. it, it, did any human other than her touch her physical body? Yeah. The answer was no. However, the action had happened to her in pixel form mm-hmm. in a headset, in a virtual world, was so real to her it stuck with her three years later causing some pretty interesting psychological work and we've I've encouraged her to get some some psych work and, and she said she was heading that way yeah um what what's what's important here to realize is that the theologian that's sitting in the library with a bunch of the books behind him that's that's saying hey you know what hey no this is, this is not a shot at you I apologize <laughs> I, don't, don't, I would have said that regardless <laughs> but that's funny. I'm sorry. But the guy who's doing that um, is different than the girl who understands this world. Yeah. And, and so the, 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 the 50s, 60s, the 70s, the people my age, listen, I'm not defining the, the ecclesiology for this next generation. I can't. It's not mm-hmm. mine to define. Uh, I'm just fighting to give them permission to control their own fate because yeah. so often we're hearing you can't, you can't, you can't. I got 20 years of you can't. And you know what? I could. I did. And if I and if I had gone back and done it again earlier uh, and had not listened to the the, the naysayers, I, I, I at least I can tell you my ministry life would have looked much different. Yeah. Uh, just just to take that. That story you bring up is actually interesting because like I'm reading um, I'm reading Dave Adamson's book right now, and he takes a similar approach where uh, and it seems to be a thread in a bunch of these is that because we see sin online. And because we see these, these these evils online, that shows us that there is a, a righteousness that can exist online. And it's something that I think needs to be explored more. Um, but something also that I see is um, it's uh, it's not a blind spot, but it is a spot where I think we're being disingenuous when like we talk about how online church works. And maybe this is just, you know, like good manners and stuff like that. That's 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 happening with how we present ourselves as christians in like uh in more public ways because like, we talk about uh social media networks as being like country-esque where it's like there's this many x many users on any given social media site and whatnot that's why we need to go there because it's using the means of the day in order to reach the people of the day and it's like well yes until you actually look at what the most popular social media site is and it's Pornhub. Has most daily users, has interactions between users and creators, has content hosting abilities. It's everything that we want to use in these other ones, but has the most people. There's your Corinth. Mm-hmm. That's like, how do you even engage that? Can a Christian engage on that? I, I don't think you c- could safely. I don't think you could from, you know, a uh, an accountability standpoint. 
Um, I'm sure you could code a way to get your content on to kind of draw people away where you never interact with the site. It gets mailed in somehow there. there I'm sure there's a way to do that and stuff, but yeah, you know, it's, that's one of those things where the, in real life, Paul went to Corinth and started drawing people out of that uh, into yeah. a, into a place that wasn't, that was in their context, but wasn't their sin. And yeah. online, it's like, I, I don't know if we can do that the same way that we can in person. And is this a part where the online church pulls people through the online church into in-person church? Because that's not the space for them. That it's actually yeah. like, no, there's people who need to be online on church and there's people who need to be offline in church, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, and there's there's all sorts of, of, of conversations around that. The, the you know, the porn hub example, um, technology, the internet's awful. It's toxic. I mean, literally, internet addiction is a thing. Uh, it was interesting. One, one of the uh, one of the largest Christian tech companies in America, the CEO, uh, asks me all the time, "Hey, Jeff, what's going to happen in virtual reality when there, our virtual lives are better than our physical lives, and we don't actually want to live physically? We want to just live in the virtual space." And, that's a great question yeah. to dig into. Like, so the e e metaverse ad addiction, the mental health of the meta, like there's so much, this girl that got raped in this space that, that three years later, she's is still triggered by the word. And, yep. and, and like, listen, I don't want to, I don't need to get into it as, as much as it is as awful as everyone describes, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. And, and so, and once again, Seth Godin, it's not about getting a billion people to agree in that. It's about getting a single person. Yep. And, and so even if it's reclaiming the internet, utilizing these tools, understanding uh, digital missionary, disciple making, growing that into churches, multiplying that out into, into movements, that's the heart of, of what we're trying to do. And it's not in mass, it's an individual. Mm -hmm. it, it's not creating content and consuming said content. It's about relationships in, in, in an authentic uh, disciple making pairings that are helping live life together mm -hmm. um it's interesting be, you know early on i'd get budgets where people be like oh you know to do digital ministry i need half a million dollars and i was like how much how much is that zoom account costing you that's ridiculous revisit that yeah. um but the, the heart of it is is that we're we're not it's even calling it a digital church for digital church it's a church uh that believes in community it mm -hmm. just happens to be that community's uh, not, you know, on the corner here where I am in Miami. It's yep. it's in a digital space. Mm -hmm. And totally. so that's that's the opportunity we've got. Totally. Well, I want to respect your time, but there is one more thing I, I wanted to uh, kind of ask you about just because it's, it's part of how we kind of got connected in the first place. Because uh, this he gets us thing that's happening via the Super Bowl ads, which is another kind of like facet of digital, you know, entertainment in our lives and whatnot. Uh, this has to be one of the most innovative things I've ever seen. You seem to have kind of like a connection to it. Can you explain what it is uh, and kind of like what your your take is on it? Yeah, sure. So it's interesting that he gets us what that is. That's actually they stole that from Global. Mm -hmm. The Global Church is it's doing media as movement. It's using that content. To, anyway, so like this is not a, not a new idea. It's just new. Here to the U.S. And, but what what it, he gets us is, is there's a number of organizations, corporations, Glue is is one of the leaders of it, but there are, are others that have created a national ad campaign called He Gets Us. It's literally He being Jesus understands us, understands you. So yeah. you know the uh, the 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 depression, the fear, uh, the mourning of loss, the um, the self doubt the judgment, whatever you're going through, he, Jesus, gets you. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the message of, of the ad. And, and these ads are, uh, I mean, shoot, I've seen them on billboards. I've seen them in the New York Times. I see them every time I watch a football game. They're all over baseball right now, live events. They're on social media. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's he gets us. And, and then there's always a landing page that it drives to. Mm -hmm. and, and so... People who see the ad, they click on the ad, they see the, the billboard, they see the URL, they go to the URL. On that URL uh, is, is, among other things, is a form that people fill out if, if they want to talk with someone. Mm -hmm. Basically, the spiritual explorer, the person that has spiritual questions, will see the ad, 
click on the ad, and then fill out the form. And the form connects them with a local church. The idea yep. initially was local. So I'm in Miami, Florida. I'm a spiritual uh, explorer. I click on the ad. I fill out the form. Ideally, a church in Miami, Florida would reach out to me. And, and you know, the church would hopefully build a relationship. I would yeah. talk with a pastor. I would talk with a volunteer. And, and, and eventually, maybe they would invite me to the church when, once it made sense. Yeah. Now, what's what's interesting is that the the demand in this situation is far more than the supply. Yeah. There are many times, like I don't even want to put a number before the X. Like it is, there's a ridiculous more amount of explorers that are wanting spiritual help than there are churches to connect them with. On top of that, they've got a problem where they can't get every city in, in the country to, to have a, a, a church. The smallest church on in America, excuse me, the smallest city in America is uh, Buford, Wyoming. And there are spiritual explorers in Buford, Wyoming. But I don't even think there's a church in Buford, Wyoming. And, and yeah. so what do we do with the church that, that that's in Buford? And really, this is where, you know, we're talking digital churches a lot in this conversation. The Facebook church that that's reaching 51% of the audience outside of the United States, they can have a spiritual conversation with anybody, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of where they live. Um, and, and so the idea that it has to be located within the physical proximity uh, mm -hmm. of their city, uh, digital churches don't operate that way. They're not stuck by that limitation. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do, honestly, is just trying to onboard as many churches as possible. How, into... does, how does that work? Because I wasn't able to really figure out, like, so working at a church myself, it's like, yeah, we did that. We we onboarded. Then there's, you know, a church up in Edmonton that can answer these questions for people who are clicking on these ads via, you know, Edmonton stuff. Even though I understand it's more more based in the States, but but yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not sure it's interesting with Canada. I, it's, it is a U.S. based campaign. And so I apologize for that. But the, the, and I don't make those rules, but the, no, 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 no. the, 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 uh, the onboarding process, people sign it up, uh, fill out the form, uh, and in the forms at the church.digital slash he gets us, mm -hmm. the church.digital slash he gets us. And so you fill out that form. Uh, and then there's uh, blue actually has an onboarding process where they walk you through how to use their platform. Uh, and then essentially, I, I mean, I don't want to overstate this, but people who have spiritual questions will show up in your inbox. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. I had I had a, a friend of mine flip the switch and you control when the switch is on, you control when the switch is off. I encourage you to recruit a team. Mm -hmm. But I had a friend who flipped the switch uh, and, and check that he was a national church, meaning that he could reach anybody, talk to anybody in the United yep. States. And he had six people in six hours. Yeah. Um, and that, that that technology allowing this to happen is one of those things where it's just, it's amazing. Like this is, this is one of those actual, actual revolutionary things that's happening. And it's getting so much shade on Twitter right now by a lot of Theo bros, where it's like, I, I get that it's not, you know, like foolproof, like gospel straight from the bottle but it's like you have to understand how powerful something like this happens like if, if it gets on the, the super bowl of all places that that drives people to local churches th this is this is evangelism like we have never seen it before like yep. technology enabled ad-based evangelism where it still directs people to a local church like this is everything i could have ever hoped for from an online kind of ministry standpoint. And I could never have imagined it. These guys are brilliant. Uh, yeah. As, but yeah, like it's, it, it really does sound like this, this is how you fill in all those weird gaps that each of your churches kind of bring with you because you're a denomination. Like you, yeah. you'll have history and baggage as an organization that stop you at a certain point from a local expression. This just plugs you into your core message. That's it. Like, let me talk to you about Jesus. So yeah, that's exciting. Totally, completely. And, and by the way, like there, uh, it was interesting. It, they, New York Times, I think, ran an article, Washington Post recently within the past week, you know, rebranding Jesus. Oh, no, Jesus Jesus needs a, uh, a new uh, uh, publicity um, rep. Uh, anyway, 100, 150 million is, is what they're reported ad, ad buys. 
So there are donors that are donating $150 million to get the message of Jesus in front of people. And and oh, yeah. in return, we, the church, are, need to step up and, and, and fill in the gaps to, to receive these tens oh, of yeah. thousands, hundreds if, of thousands of people. Like this is, oh, yeah. this is if, an incredible If an in-person church was having six people, like a person every hour show up on their door to come talk to a pastor like about Jesus and it was through yeah. a door not a telephone through a door not an email and stuff like that they'd be hiring new staff like oh, yeah. it, it'd be like oh something like a revival is happening and that's this this is the closest thing to an actual digital revival i think that we we're seeing like in the absence of a billy graham figure going viral like some like you know internet celebrity type thing uh this is this is like this is taking that out and making it just about Jesus and getting people connected to Christians. And it's like, this is exciting. This is this is really exciting, given kind of where we're at. I'm going to steal that language. Digital you, you are You are more than welcome I, to. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you credit, Mike. That that, that was good. But I, I do. I'll write I an article. Like you can, you yeah, can there, there you me. Go. <laughs> so. Well, um, I don't want to uh, take too much of your time. I don't know what the, the whole time difference is or if you have to go. It looks like we've got about six minutes left. But... Um, I, I try to end every one of my interviews off uh, with the two same questions. Uh, what are you reading and how can I pray for you in the, uh, in the next couple of weeks? I, I keep a, a book here where I keep all my like analog and I, and I try to keep track of like prayer and stuff like that. So what are you reading and how can I pray for you? You know, it's interesting. I got two books on my desk and so I'll, I'll, I'll share them with you right here. Yeah. Meta Church, you, you mentioned okay. that earlier. Uh, Kingdom Innovation. Yeah, very good on that. Kingdom Innovation by Doug Paul. Okay. Uh, it's a little older book. Uh, came out of 100M. Um, and, but, the, you know, that's that's currently some of the stuff we're working on right now. I um, Honestly, I'm in I'm in right mode. Uh, we're I'm borderline close to signing a, a major publishing deal that would be multiple books a year and, and starting to to lean lean that direction. So trying mm -hmm. to get my, my ducks in a row. I'm, um, my first book is getting published. In a couple months my second book uh that i'm, I'm co-writing the second one with someone will get published in january cool and, and so um to be honest just time uh direction i it's funny for a guy that was told no most of his life uh, i i don't like saying no i like saying yes mm. and um you know there's there's lots of opportunities there's lots of uh of paths that, that are open right now and so it's it's just peaceably kind of praying through how to say yes or what to say yes and and, and what the the right roads are mm. i keep i keep trying to fool myself oh i can do it all i can do it i can do it all i can do it all i can do it all i don't i don't think i can do it all so that's that's the challenge right now is trying to figure out okay what am i saying no to um you know I, for a couple of decades i've always been the guy that pray the prayer of god i'm a stupid man open wide the doors that i'm supposed to go through so an idiot like me can go through and shut the doors so tight that I'm not supposed to go through, shut it so tight that it hurts. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're praying that right now. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. And uh, this has been a great conversation. It's kind of opened my eyes to a, a few things I wasn't thinking about. I, uh, I hope it was the same for you, but I, I really appreciate it uh, being able to talk. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, here's, uh, here's to, you know, a decade of online ecclesiology, I guess, you know, just <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> decade of online ecclesiology all right hey mike thanks for the time uh loved it and uh let's do it again yeah sounds good i'll uh, i'll be in touch take care yep bye-bye